Hey everybody, welcome back to the Mentor Nation podcast. I'm your host, John Abbas, and I just want to thank you for being here with me today. I want to thank you for listening. Uh, if you have ever listened to this podcast before, you'll know that I just really love having great conversations with people that are doing extraordinary things, building companies, entertainers, like anybody doing something awesome. I've had actors, actresses, film producers, entrepreneurs, CEOs. I've had active duty military that have seen things that you can't even imagine. And my goal in these conversations has always been the same. How can I have a conversation in such a way that I can extract value from them and deliver it to you? And I work really, really hard just to make sure that each conversation has a mixture of stories, takeaways, and, and just actionable items that you can use right away to improve whatever, your life, your business, anything. And that brings me to today because one of the things that really fascinates me today are people that are building companies that not only experience massive success, but are also doing a lot of good for people or the planet or the environment. You know, I think a lot of people think that it's really hard to do both, especially in the beginning. Like when you first start a company, a lot of times you think you just have to focus on you and growing and, and getting it where it needs to be. And then once you're making money, then you can start focusing on good and nonprofit work and things like that. But it's the people that are doing both from day one that really fascinate me. And that's why I think that you're going to enjoy my conversation today with Monik Suri. Monik is the founder and CEO of a company called Therma. Now, Therma is focused on combating climate change and minimizing food and energy waste with their cutting edge technology and temperature monitoring and analytics. I probably did not do the best job of explaining that, but their company is experiencing huge growth. It's used by thousands of massive companies all over the world. Businesses, restaurants trust their technology. It's cutting edge, just like literally the Apple of what they do. Um, they just raised a $10 million round of funding to fuel their growth. They're doing a lot of good. And in this episode, uh, Monik sheds light on why companies that focus on social good and growth are gaining more market share, but I'll, I'll, I'll just be honest with you. My favorite part of this interview is just interviewing a brilliant founder that is in the trenches building a disruptive company and all of the things that go into executing a really big vision. He's it, it, just a smart guy. You'll see that. And he just does a great, great, great job. There's a lot of great takeaways from this interview, and I'm just excited for you to listen. So thank you for being with me today. Enjoy, and please help me welcome Monik Suri. Monik, welcome to the podcast. It is awesome to have you on. I'm excited for the conversation, man. Thank you for being here. Pleasure to be on. Really great to have uh, the opportunity to share the story. Thanks. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, for those of you listening, uh, Monik, and please, I mean, my last name is super long, but please correct me if I'm saying it. Monik Suri, is that is that correct? That's that's correct. That's better than most. Yay. Right. Yay. So for those of you listening, Monik is a brilliant entrepreneur, um, just a lot of fun to research. He's the founder of Therma, which I'm going to let you talk about here in just a minute. Uh, but the thing that that has me really excited about this interview is... About especially just is what you're doing. You know, it, you're a forward thinker. And, you know, to me, from the research that I've done, you're leading the charge of entrepreneurs that are starting companies that are combining sustainability and, you know, like impact as much as profitability. And I've had some incredible people on that are just doing really cool things. And so I'm just excited to have you talk about all things, your company and just what you're doing and the charge that you're leading. But before we begin, I just wanted to ask uh, if you could speak to that, because for many years, obviously companies focus on profits over everything, you know, transportation companies, oil companies, energy companies, food companies got us into a really big mess, done a lot of damage. And I just wanted to ask, you know, are you 
it seems like a shift is happening right now with people starting companies. Like, are you seeing that? We are. We are. I uh, working from home, John. It's always a, a dynamic environment, but I do feel totally there's a. I do feel there's a shift in how people are approaching their uh, professional lives and their personal lives. There's, you know, a sense amongst uh, you know many many people that there's not this kind of divide between who we are at work and who we are at home mm -hmm. in a way that there might have been in a previous generation. And so now people's values and what they care about at a personal level is increasingly shaping and informing what they work on, where they work, uh, and, and you know how they approach work. So uh, I see that a lot with entrepreneurs. I see that a lot with uh, employees even and consumers. But on the entrepreneurial side, I think a lot of folks see opportunity in right. aligning uh, social good with um, with 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 economic uh, impact and economic success, and so that's definitely affecting and in a good way bringing a lot more capital, human and financial, into climate and other areas of pro-social innovation. Gotcha. Now that brings me to my next question because I wanted to ask you about the investor side of things as well. You know, you uh, are no stranger to fundraising, and uh, I read that you raised a pretty, pretty big round. You know, several months back, I think it was March of 2021. And so, what's it like on the investor side of things? Like, are they more interested in the mission of climate change and sustainability, or are they more interested still in like, you know, the money side of it or the, the opportunity side of it, like with EVs and some of these other companies out there? Like, what are you seeing with investors? I, I think we're we're seeing a lot of investors who care about demonstrating to their stakeholders, their LPs, and um, and their broader stakeholders, their associates, their principals, their partners, that they can get above market return while mm. in, while identifying and investing in pro social businesses. And I think that's the incredible thing about the time we're living through, the, there is opportunity to generate above market return by pursuing solutions in areas that historically were underserved. And those solutions uh, can be addressing public needs and public problems as well. And of course, uh, I think climate is one of them. So you see a record amount of climate technology and climate capital forming and being mm -hmm. deployed, You know, much more in the last two years than in the last 20. And so that, that, I think, is what's in investors' minds. They're definitely returns-oriented, no question. Awesome. Um, this is not philanthropic. but <laughs> I love it. You know, it's, it's, and, and the reason I ask is I had a, a brilliant guest on a couple months back. Her name is Emily O'Brien, and she created this whole company in her early 20s that's now exploding globally. And, you know, she takes movie sets who are huge wasters. Like, I mean – what you couldn't imagine the amount of waste that goes into creating like a film or a television production. And she makes them completely sustainable. And, you know, there was just, she had a period of time where it was very difficult. And now it's like, she can't expand her company fast enough. And so I always like to start there um, and just ask that question. So I'm excited now, Monik, just to get into your story, you know, like what's like your background and what led you to founding Thermo? I appreciate that, John. I yeah. think, uh, you know, my dad likes to say that uh, life is a is a journey and you don't really know where the twists and turns are taking you. But when you look back in the rearview mirror, it all kind of makes sense. Uh, and so I started out my career in finance. I was an investor first. Um, hmm. So I went to Harvard for college, uh, went to work at a big uh, investment firm, hedge private equity fund called D.E. Shaw, based out of New York. Uh, from there, I ended up uh, deciding to go back to grad school. I really wanted to, to work on public problems and public policy. So I went back to Harvard for law school and ended up uh, doing a short stint in uh, yeah, a lot of winters in Boston, a lot of cold, a lot of snow, <laughs> many, many winters in, in Harvard <laughs> Square. Um, I met my wife there, which was definitely the best thing that happened. That's uh, awesome. We met in college. And I, I got to, to meet, uh, I was doing a, a short stint in the Obama White House uh, working as a junior person on the economic policy team in 2011. Wow. And I met the deputy CTO. She was a former lawyer. She jokes, a recovering attorney uh, herself, Beth Novak. And 
Beth had kind of gotten interested in technology before it was cool. She had taught herself how to write code in the early 2000s and started working on the intersection of technology, law, and government. And mm -hmm. she was uh, excited about and passionate about bringing tech to bear on problems around law and government compliance and regulation. So when she left government, I left with her to start a center um, where she was teaching at NYU. And we mm -hmm. expanded it to MIT called the Governance Lab or GovLab. And that's how I got into tech. So my background was, was in uh, finance and, and, and law. I ended up getting into tech, trying to bring technology into public policy, compliance and regulation areas that were historically underserved, where you know stuff is run like it's 1950. Yeah. And um, so we started uh, working together in 2012. And then a couple of years later, I uh, decided to start a company in that space, uh, thinking that, hey, there's a way to build a business here. And my co-founder, who's still my co-founder, Aaron Cohen, uh, he was the third guy at the GovLab. He was teaching at NYU at the time, mm -hmm. and Beth had recruited him to help her get the center off the ground. Now, he's 20 years older than me and uh, has been working in tech since the late 90s. He's a serial entrepreneur. This is his sixth startup. And Aaron and I came together to work on a, a project around compliance and regulation, uh, ways to use tech to make it uh, health and safety, compliance and regulation more effective and and uh, and ultimately better for, for consumers. Around that time, Chipotle had a food safety crisis uh, that you might remember in late yeah. 15, early 16, and we ended up in the food supply chain in response to that. So we started working with restaurants, food distributors, food manufacturers, and that's how we got into food uh, with safety and, and, and quality management and basically a product that replaced pen and paper. And that's how I became a uh, entrepreneur and they can tell you more about what we're building today. Yeah. A lot to unpack with what you just said, you know, rule number one, surround yourself with smart people. I, I think your, um, your business partner is, is his wife, your COO as well. Is that his wife? I th I no, uh, that's a, those are two other colleagues of ours. That's Andrew oh. Hager and Amber. Uh, they are okay. married. They are married. That's our, uh, our CTO. And CTO. Our COO. Okay. Yes. That's, yeah. My fault. I, I just, I looked at your team and I was like, wow, they have a really, really strong team. And then I saw two of them had the same last name. And I was like, hmm, I wonder, I mean, brother, sister, Absolutely. husband, wife. <laughs> yeah, we jo we jokingly, we call it the A team. Um, Aaron, you know, my co-founder, Andrew, who joined four years ago and is now our CTO. And then Amber, who joined uh, two and a half years ago and is now our COO. We call them the A team. But, That's uh, awesome. That's yeah. awesome. So I want to dive into Thermum because you have a, a really cool product and I'm excited for you to talk about it, why it hadn't been done before. I mean, I just like, I want to get into like all the things that your company does because uh, it's a really, really cool concept and I can totally see, you know, how it's, why it's growing at the rate that it at, it is. But can you explain to the people that are listening, like what, what is Therma and like, what's the problem that you're solving? Absolutely. So we, uh, we think of Therma as a smart refrigeration company, a, a smart refrigeration company focused around overhauling the cold chain, which is the refrigeration supply chain. Now, refrigeration uh, sounds boring uh, and it sounds old and old fashioned. So not an area you think of modern technology. But I think what's really interesting about refrigeration is it's a massive sector. It's been around for 100 plus years. And it's extremely inefficient. Um, refrigeration is responsible for a huge part of human health. Uh, the delivery of protein, uh, fruits and vegetables, produce on the food side, all depends on refrigeration. So does the delivery of pharmaceuticals, blood and plasma, and it turns out vaccines. And so refrigeration has actually become really important to many, many people around the world in the last two years because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's been growing in importance for the past couple of decades because as more and more of the world uh, industrializes and develops, people want protein and fruits and vegetables and produce. And so refrigeration is growing rapidly as a sector. It's growing at 12 to 15% uh, year over year, which is a very, very fast growth rate. A lot of yeah. that's happening around the world. It's also a big source of emissions. It's a huge driver of global warming, and most people don't realize that. And that's why we're working on this space. You have to make refrigeration work. You've got to get refrigeration working and accessible for many, many people to have access to these life-giving food and pharmaceuticals. But 
if we continue running refrigeration assets the way we have for the last hundred years, there's a ton of product waste. All, you know, food waste is a really big driver of emissions and a big human problem. There's a lot of uh, energy waste. Refrigeration is responsible for 15% of all electricity consumed in the US, 15%. Wow. And wow. it's also, there's a lot of refrigerants. Refrigerants are the chemicals that go into refrigeration to cool stuff. Well, those refrigerants, when they leak, cause a lot of warming. They're 1,000 to 10,000 times more warming than CO2. Um, and most people don't know that. So food waste, energy waste, and refrigerant waste together are you know, 6 to 7% of all emissions. And it's growing. The sector is growing rapidly. So that's right. the kind of problem that we have to grapple with as a species. You know, When you have inefficiency like that, we think of Therma's mission as building technology to advance human health while protecting the planet itself. And that's really the, the focus. And so we use IoT enabled sensors. That's one of the things we've developed is a, is a hardware enabled monitoring layer. So we use a new type of connectivity on the hardware layer to get signal out, out of refrigeration wirelessly. That's historically not been possible because refrigeration, the siding, uh, the steel or iron siding blocks a lot of electromagnetic radiation. It's, it acts like a, a Faraday cage. It blocks signal from getting out. So Wi-Fi and Bluetooth-based sensors can't get a signal out of the inside of a fridge or freezer wirelessly. And that's why <laughs> most know. of the first, yeah, most people, we, we, you know, that was new to me as well a couple of years ago. <laughs> and um, my, my CTO, Andrew, had a background in IoT, Internet of Things sensors and hardware. And at one point we were watching users using our first product, CoInspect, our compliance app that I was telling you about. Yep. They were using it to check all these safety and quality controls in restaurants. We had about 5,000 locations using the product. We were out there watching users using the app and he looked at me and said, you know, one of the big things they're checking all the time is refrigeration. They're checking the temperature of all the product for safety and quality. It doesn't make sense for them to do that with a mobile app. That still requires them to check it four to eight times a day we should use a sensor to automate that. So he went off and looked at ways to get signal out of the inside of refrigeration. And we realized that there was a new type of connectivity layer, a uh, long range radio, LoRa, that could get signal out of the inside of a refrigerator. And that's how we got started working on Therma. Therma is short for temperature, humidity, energy, remote monitoring application. That's the- just so, just so I'm, I'm clear and like, I want to dumb this down for anybody like me. Uh, so like I, my main business, I own a, a large preschool just outside of Nashville. And so we have quite a bit of refrigeration in there. I mean, obviously it's children, so it's very important to us. So our refrigerators right now have this stupid thermometer inside that's like from the 1960s, it seems like. And that's really the only way we know what the temperature is inside, you know, the power has went out sometimes during storms here in Tennessee, which we get. And we didn't know over the weekend until we got there on Monday. And even at first look, we weren't really aware of it. So your sensor, I mean, complete, like it's literally, I, I would get an alert if something, if it were to what rise above a certain temperature a threshold, is that, is that what you're saying? Or the humidity changed? Is that right? That's exactly right. That's the base layer of the product. The base layer of the product is an alarm or an alert to protect your inventory and to protect your perishables. So the idea <laughs> here is giving you peace of mind 24 seven when you have um, thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars of inventory, um, you know, there's three big sources of loss. There's energy and electricity grid issues. So brownouts and blackouts, yep. power failures. There's equipment issues compressors, wiring, refrigerant leaks, um, co fans, coils going down. And then there's human error. Uh, <laughs> people unplugging stuff to clean it, forgetting to plug it back in. People yep. um, going ahead and changing the settings or leaving something at the wrong set point during a defrost cycle. People leaving a door jam loose or open, um, or in <laughs> some cases, propping stuff open for hours to do inventory delivery. So what yep. we see is across you know, uh, a whole range of customers these kinds of issues, uh, power, equipment, and human failures cause tens of thousands of inventory loss every year. And businesses just internalize that, you know, a couple hundred bucks here, a couple hundred bucks here. That's just the way, you know, business has to get done. We've been able to eliminate huge amounts of that waste. We're using 24-7 monitoring to give people real-time visibility and alerting. That's kind of layer one. On top of that, we've also created insights that can help 
businesses and, and, and organizations identify issues like, hey, it turns out that every Friday at 2 a.m., you have a spike in your temperature in your walk-in fridge. Every week, why is that? Well, we can see that in the data, we can surface it. And we've, we've had, we send that to an operations director. They discover that a cleaning crew is coming in middle of the night and propping doors open and leaving it open all night while they're cleaning up stuff and just burning shelf life and burning energy. Uh, we can also identify equipment failures early. By seeing patterns in the temperature and humidity data, we can identify when equipment's gonna go down before it goes down, eliminating the need for a last mile, last minute repair, service disruption, and you know all that goes with. And we're also starting to work on energy optimization. So identifying when there's overcooling. A lot of businesses overcool, not realizing that it may not be necessary to run things that inefficiently. And when you can over when you can reduce unnecessary overcooling, that can save you money and of course be good for the planet. So that's some of the intelligence we're building. It's it's so genius. Like I, I, I for many, many years I thought that the most genius business in the planet was home security. Like I always thought it was the most genius thing ever existed. Like you mean to tell me that you can create a service that somebody has to pay you every month for, and they pray to God that they don't ever have to use it. And if they do have to use it, all you do is call 911 for them and send the police there. I always thought that, but yours might actually be smarter. I mean, it's just, so why, like, cause as I was reading what your tech, I didn't realize underneath the base layer, I, you know, obviously I, assume temperature humidity but i didn't realize like all the analytics that you guys are building underneath that that's unbelievable like not for obviously a small bit but man i can only imagine some of these large companies like cisco or us foods or like thousands and thousands of refrigerators how important that would be like why do you think somebody like or the manufacturers like never created that before and and i'll explain exactly why i'm asking you this question and it, how it relates to other entrepreneurs and listeners, but like, why do you think it hadn't been done? Absolutely, it's right on as a question. So I think that there's two issues. One, until recently, you couldn't get a wireless signal out of the inside of a refrigeration interior. And so the only option was to run a wired sensor. Now a wired sensor requires drilling a line in through the side of the, of the refrigerator, running an ethernet cable, and then connecting it to a hardwired sensor. That is expensive. It requires a technician and it requires drilling. So you're talking about five or 10K for an install. When you're putting that kind of uh, capital expenditure and you have you know hundreds of refrigeration units or thousands, you're only going to do that if you have a huge amount of inventory at stake. Yeah. So the kinds of companies that would do that were hospital systems, uh, blood banks, fertility clinics, maybe a Costco or a Walmart on the main line refrigeration where they have hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of inventory. But if you're a McDonald's or a Starbucks or a Pizza Hut or a Domino's or a Taco Bell, all customers of ours, or a Marriott mm -hmm. Hotel or a Now Foods or a Wyndham, they don't have enough inventory in any given location to justify a wired sensor. It's just, you know, the juice ain't worth the squeeze. Yep. And so, yep. um, you know, even wired sensors have huge limitations. One of the big limitations is uh, you can't move them and they have a limited radius. So when you have a large refrigeration space, like a cold storage warehouse, you might have a couple of wired sensors in there that the, the construction firm puts up when they put the box up, but they only have a range of you know, 20, 30 feet. The space might have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of cubic feet. And so we're actually deploying Therma in warehouses as well, because what they really want is a distribution of the heat, right. not just a, a single reading. And so I think the technology wasn't there and the, the wired technology that was, was just too expensive. And that's a classic you know, opportunity for startups like ours uh, to, to disrupt. You know, we get new technology, proliferate that, but ultimately we're not a hardware company, we're a data company. Right. And so this is all about like creating intelligence with the, with the data we collect. That's so cool. And the reason I asked you that question is because you know, the, the typical listener of this podcast, they're all entrepreneurs, a lot of solopreneurs, small to medium business owners up to like three, 4 million a year in revenue. That's just the demographic. And I just, I have a lot of friends that they are like you, right? They see problems and they talk themselves out of starting a business because they'll do a little bit of digging. They're like, Oh, like somebody's probably already solved that problem. And some of the ideas that I see are just so good. And it's just like something when I'm, I'm hearing you talk, I'm like, wow, you know, you would think that, the refrigeration companies would have tackled this or this company would have, but they really didn't. And you have now built this really awesome business that I can 
only imagine the upside. I mean, really, in just the growth as uh, what, like, so when it comes to growing, like, what's what's like the the crux of growth? Is it awareness? Is it staffing? Is it people? Like, what's like the the thing right now? Like, where are you at in your business? Absolutely. Right now, I think a big focus is on um, you know building brand awareness and mm. celebrating the wins. Uh, we've we've grown uh, fairly quickly over the last two years. We've had two very strong you know three uh, x years, three x and three x growth on each. Despite the industries that we sell to having two of their hardest years ever, um, you know, food, hospitality, food service, retail, restaurants. I've had super, super tough years. So it's really exciting and encouraging that despite that, they're looking for solutions like ours that can help them save money, reduce labor time spent because they can automate stuff, get visibility into operations and stores that are less staffed than they were pre-pandemic. But what we need to do is get more people uh, to know about the, the products. And so we're investing heavily in brand marketing, content marketing, um, yep. You know, c- celebrating the wins, uh, finding ways to connect with community, uh, generating referrals. We do sell to a lot of small businesses. You know, a mm-hmm. lot of our customers have, you know, a few locations, um, you know, or, or, or a couple of locations. Uh, yes, we have customers that have, you know, hundreds of locations or are national brands. Uh, but but a lot of our customers are SMB, you know, small, mid-sized businesses. And mostly they can buy our sensors online. We have an e-commerce platform. So you don't have to talk to a human. Yeah. So just to elaborate on that, um, you guys have a really great model, a subscription model, like eliminating the huge upfront cost of equipment and everything. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but like, this is something that anybody can install themselves like very quickly. Right. It's like, it just, Hey, you order it comes in and then you're good to go. Is that right? Exactly. It's a, it's very much uh, designed to be a self-serve model. You go on a website, put in your type of business profile, the kind of equipment you have. We send you a little recommendation sheet. A few things we would recommend you should monitor. You can put in your credit card, have sensors shipped to you and have them up and running the next week. The goal <laughs> is for an 18 year old to be able to do it, an associate or a summer, uh, you know, a summer staffer to do it. That's really cool. Have you ever heard of the Harmon brothers? So they I have not. So they're the ones there, that I- like, create crazy funny like commercials for like brands like um poopery and the squatty potty and like they've taken these brands to like hundreds of millions of dollars in sales by just creating these really hilarious commercials that go absolutely viral like they're just they're famous for that with like really wild but i don't know i just didn't know if you've ever heard of them but I wanted to follow that with, I was, you know, watching this short video of you. This is like a testament to how far, you know, you've come in this business. I, I thought it was current, but I guess it was 2019. And you're like, man, we're so excited. We've got like 60,000 a month in revenue. And then it was like 2019. I think it was a 2019 video. Um, I don't know if it was the one on your website or somewhere I saw it, but it's just really cool to see how you've grown and grown and grown since then. So, um, I have a couple more questions, if you don't mind. My first one is just all of the entrepreneurs that are listening, what advice would you give to those that have just started a business? Because you've been there. You've started companies, several companies. You've raised money. You've scaled companies. So I just want to ask a couple questions in that that journey. You know, to an entrepreneur starting their business or they've just started their business, what has been the biggest advice or the biggest things that have helped you or that you focused on that was really like, you're glad that you did? And so many things, John, that I, I wish <laughs> I'd known years ago. I feel like a lot of the white hair uh, that I'm now kind of sharing on Zoom every day could have been avoided. But sometimes, you know, there's no better teacher than than, than experience. And life right. is, is, I think... Uh, uh, you know, Tolstoy has a quote, uh, suffering is the necessary condition for growth. So sometimes right. you have to go through the pain to feel to feel the way through. I think one of the best things I ever you know heard and one of the most powerful things was, again, from my dad, who's one of my um, absolute all time heroes and just a person awesome. I admire. He kind of said to me when I was young, no matter what, believe in yourself, like you're going to doubt yourself. You're going to have, you know, all kinds of things come up in life but really believe in yourself at the end of the day. And I think as an entrepreneur, that's doubly true. 
there's so much uncertainty in the world and so many frictions and so many challenges yeah. we face. Just and as an entrepreneur, you're bringing more of those on. <laughs> like you're, that's right. you're saying, hey, I want to kind of do something new. I want to do something that's not been done. When I started working is in at Coinspec, you know, we had like fifty thousand dollars. That was our budget for the year, um, for the year. Wow. You know? And you know, I live in San Francisco in the Bay Area. That's <laughs> That's not going to get you that many engineers in in the Bay Area, it turns out. So, you know, <laughs> there's, you know, we're still a small team, we're like 65 people, but it's um, it's really important, I think, as an entrepreneur. And I've struggled so many times with this, not to lose faith in yourself. Whatever you're working on, whatever you think matters, if it matters to you, and if you really believe there's something there, follow that instinct, follow that hunch, and despite the many, many, many signals you might get, despite the many different ways uh, you might feel you know, failure and defeat. And I think I've felt failure at least a half a dozen times a day for yeah. the last you know, half a dozen years. Um, if you can remind yourself that you know, you're ultimately your best ally, you're ultimately your best source of truth and wisdom and go inward, I really think that, that betting on yourself and believing in yourself is key. And a lot of other stuff flows from that. If you can, if you can do that and keep doing that, but it's, it's not easy. And, and so the second thing I would say is surround yourself with people that are betting on you um, and that believe in you. Because, you know, there's another saying, you know, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You know, I'm so grateful to my, my wife, who I've now been with for 20 years. Uh, we met as freshmen wow. in college, literally the first week of college. Um, and so she's my best friend and she's known me my whole, you know, adult life. Wow. Uh, my co-founder, Aaron, who I've known for a decade, these are people who, you know, every time I wanted to quit, every time a deal fell through, a financing fell through, every time, you know, at the start of COVID, we almost ran out of capital. We were down to a couple of weeks of runway. And, you know, it was like one of those moments of having to write the letter to the team. If people around you believe in you and tell you, yeah, you can get through this, you can figure this out. It gives you that strength and that sense of sustenance that you need that we all need. So, you know, those are two of the things that stand out for me. That's awesome. Just really great advice. And speaking on what you said about your, your dad, you know, it's just funny how when you're young, you don't take the advice seriously. Like I always thought my dad didn't understand or he doesn't know what he's talking, but you know, like looking back now, you know, my dad passed a few years ago, but just looking back, like he came to America during the Iranian revolution, came as a refugee, had nothing, no money. And it's just like, look back. I'm just like, man, I'm such a dumbass for like, like he had it figured out. Like he knows what he's talking about. Who am I to like discredit that until you get old? But that's the, you know, that's the journey sometimes, right? You don't realize it until you go through enough suffering. They're like, oh yeah, they did. They did too. But just really, really great advice. Um, is there anything that you would like the listeners to know about your company that we haven't already spoke about um, you know, it's a great opportunity just, you know, to promote what you're doing, what you're going to do. I think everybody has a pretty good grasp on, and especially since you started talking about small business, I didn't know that I honestly, before this interview, I thought it was more for like larger companies, huge, but that's really cool that you have that. Cause just, you know, even I can imagine any restaurant, why, like, why wouldn't they right? like starting, I think it's what, like $10 a month. It's nothing with it. They can have the service. Uh, but is there anything else that you'd like for them to know? Appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. We're looking to work with, um, you know, forward thinking entrepreneurs, business owners that, you know, care about sustainability, care about reducing waste, but also people who just want to save money and make their operations more efficient and effective. Um, a lot of our customers are small, uh, bottom line focused, you know, very pragmatic business Right. executives and operators. So check us out if you're interested in learning more about smart refrigeration. Uh, our website is hellotherma.com, hellotherma, T-H-E-R-M-A.com. If you want to talk about opportunities to partner um, or, or you know, we're growing, we have about a dozen open roles on our team. If you want to check awesome. out any roles on our team, my email is monik, M-A-N-I-K at hellotherma.com. And uh, we're, we're always looking for friends and partners uh, love to stay in touch. Uh, one of the things that came, you know, that, as you were speaking, John, about your father reminded me of this, another quote I love, the older I get, the wiser my dad becomes. Um, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> it's definitely like some of these things you have to experience to appreciate the wisdom. 
but I love to talk to other entrepreneurs. So if you ever want to share a virtual coffee or share stories from the trenches, uh, please reach out. And yeah, maybe we'll do it in the metaverse. (laughs) Oh my God. If someone can explain the metaverse to me, I'll take them out for a virtual beer or coffee. Exactly. And last thing, but not least guys, those listening, Monik is a dog lover. If you didn't hear earlier, So, you know, we all love animals here. And so it's better to buy from someone that loves animals than someone that doesn't. So check out Hello Therma. That's my little play. I love, we love dogs. So it's just one of those things. I I appreciate that, John. That's my dog, Espresso. She's a rescue. (laughs) She's definitely the shot of caffeine that you need when you're working from home. But yeah, great to be on today. Thank you. I love it, man. Congratulations. Thank you so much for your time today. And um, I'll look forward to just following your success, man. Thank you, Monica. Thanks so much. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. You too.